Hey everybody, final thoughts time for X Delivery Switch. There is a lot to recommend in this game, and I think its single strongest strength, is that right? Yes, oh fine, it is the variability you get. I mean, not only do you get such a huge amount of different unique player powers with all those really, really cool meeples, although, I mean, none of them beat the gelatinous cube on coolness factor, but, you know, the witches and the robots and the mummies and the ghosts, they all do very, very different things. Depending on who you are at the beginning of the game, it will make your game play out very differently. You'll have, a, you know, even though you're trying to do the same thing every time you play, build the best library through set collection, the way you go about it will feel very different from game to game. And if that weren't enough, the game world itself changes so radically every time you play. Because the game comes with a huge stack of all those building tiles, and every time you play, you're going to get a different um, suite of them. Some of them come out only for one round, some of them stick around for the entire game. And there's so much variety in them. You know, from like, I, you just barely saw me scratch the surface, start getting in. I mean, you, you might play a game where you spend the entire game dealing with auctions. Another time you play, the auction building won't ever show up or it'll only show up for one round, and the whole game feels so different because the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the book fair showed up instead of the, you know, and it's the one that stuck around. So that's really clever, really solid, and I like that a lot. So much variation, um, which is great because, like I said, you're doing the same thing every time you play. You're you're just trying to collect the right cards and build them in this kind of interesting almost kind of push your luck puzzle element to the actual laying out of your library because well in the run through you saw I got kind of lucky I found some letters that were pretty close to each other a bunch of eyes and whatnot and I it's kind of nice because it kind of goes kind of in the center. It could be at the end of your first row or at the beginning of your second row. It gives you a lot of flexibility to start out that way. But what if you're looking at a lot of disparate letters and you have a J and then you have an N and you're like, oh, I just got a bonus. I can actually shelve something. I've already shelved the J. Should I shelve the N? That's skipping a lot of cards. I don't have any cards that could go between the J and the N right now, so it's probably fine. But what happens later if I end up getting some M's and now I'm stuck? Well, that's the push your luck. Do you snap them together? Because there's only so much time this game is going to last. The game is over once one player has pl has shelved a certain number of cards. I think in a two-player game it's 16 uh, cards, and you know that can sneak up very very quick as you're watching your opponent's shelf getting bigger and bigger. Okay, you know what? I can't afford to wait to get some M's to slip in. I got to put that next that in right now because I got to keep building. Because until I put that in down, I can't put down this P I've got. And because I've got three P's, and I want to put them all together. Um, you know, so. Uh, but you always have to build orthogonally. So, okay, well, do I build over and then around and then back up? You don't have much time, and so you will have to push your luck. And sometimes it'll blow up in your face, because then the very next turn you get those M's you want to squip in there. But you're not out of luck either, because there are buildings and there are a pair of special powers that let you shift stuff around after the fact. So maybe you'll stumble across one of those. Heck, maybe this will be the game where one of those buildings ended up early in the game being something that's stuck around forever, so you can be much more laissez-faire about how you're going to put all your stuff down. You don't have to worry so much about that kind of clockwork puzzle, because you know you can always readjust stuff in future rounds if that's how you use your workers. Again, that's a testament to just how much variety you're going to get from game to game out of playing this game. It's really sharp that way, and there's a lot to like. That said, there are some issues with it. I think, by far, the number one issue, and you probably noticed it if you were watching the run-through, the text on those buildings is so hard to read. It's just really thin, tiny font against really busy backgrounds, and a lot of times, I mean, you know, Jen and I, we were having to, like, hold it up and get out glasses and stuff like that to read. We ultimately got to the point where we just didn't look at the at the, at the uh, tiles that represent the buildings, because in the back of the rule book, there's a very good thorough breakdown of what every single building did. Oh, a new building came in. Let's not even bother reading that. Let's just look at what the rule book said. And we just kept it on that page and handed the rule book. It's kind of a real shame the game didn't come with like a player aid or something like that, or all that information just in one place on the back page of the manual, so you could look at that very quickly and easy. But by the same token, it's a real shame they just didn't make it clearer and easier to read on the cards themselves. Also, it's really important you do check the rules because some of these cards, they are, even though they're pretty verbose, they have a lot of text on them, they don't, aren't always completely um, forthcoming with all the information you need to know. Like the first time Jen and I played this, she ended up getting the ghost who has a special power that once the ghost goes to a place, nobody else can go there with any of their workers because they're scared away by the ghost. And we're like, oh my god, this is so powerful. Jen completely destroyed me. And it wasn't until after we were like, Let's look up this ghost. Oh my gosh, the ghost can only go on immediate spaces. It can't go on long-term spaces. Jen spent the entire game using the ghost to keep me out of the auction house. And that's how she won. It was, um, you know, 
And it doesn't say that on the player's card, even though there's a lot of text. There's enough text where you think, yeah, everything I need to know is here. That's not always the case. Double check the rule book. Just some weird little things like that, which is odd because the production value of this game is through the roof. I mean, Forget about the fact that they named over 500 unique books um, that are thematically tied to what they're supposed to be based on their color and also you know, stick to the, the A to Z. And a lot of them really just made Jen literally laugh out loud while we were playing. Um, and, you know, th that's amazing. But, I mean, they, they go above beyond all the cool little minis for your special workers. The final um, play... They, this game doesn't come with a pad of paper that you write down everything with. It actually comes with what looks like a big... It's a big piece of cardboard that looks like a... Uh, checklist, like a clipboard. And it also comes with a dry erase marker. So you write down everybody's score on this, and it looks like you are playing the council person who's going around checking all the... It's very cool and very thematic. So, you know, there, there's some little missteps here and there, but on the whole, it's a very sharp game. That said, the bigger issue I had with it, I think, really has to do, one, as a two-player game, I don't think the worker placement is as much fun as it's going to be because so many of these buildings and player powers are really going to come to the fore if there's more than just one other player. It works. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely fun. But while we're playing the game, we're constantly thinking, man, it'd be a lot more interesting if there were more opportunities to go to this building. I um, mean, you were really trying to make a tough choice of, you know, because you could go to all four spaces. All four spaces could be used in a four-player game, but only two of them could be in a two. Um, you know, or that cube is going to be much more powerful if you go to a place where three other players might activate it instead of just one. So there's lots of little things like that that just make me feel like, man, I think it'd be better with more players. Um, also, this is a really funky thing. It may or may not be a problem for you. The game, depending on how quick players are, and they should be quick. Remember, this is a race. But if you dilly-dally at all, you will find before too long the permanent buildings that stick around. There's so many of them because one of them gets saved every single round after round that you can have, gosh, well, I mean, you know, a ton of them. And as the game goes on, I mean, you, it's not like you have more workers. You, um, and either you really just kind of focus, but it, it gets to the point where there's so much stuff you can do. It, it, it kind of feels weird that there wasn't something like, hey, you know what, after the fourth round um, the, and the fifth round, don't just put yet another thing on there. The oldest one, or something like that gets removed and replaced with a new one. So there's a little bit more churn and there's just not quite so many worker placement options. It just gets a little overburdensome. Now, to be fair, I think as you get better at the game and you become a faster player, the game won't last long enough for that to happen, but it is still something that can happen, so that's something to be aware of. Oh, and also, for the final scoring, specifically because one of the metrics you can score is variety. You want to have a variety of all types of books because you can score a ton of points that way. But what that means is, is your bookshelf gets bigger and bigger and you've got eight, nine, ten um, uh, shelves full of books all over the place. You, as the game goes on, you spend a lot of time, right, okay, now how many yellows do I have? All right, how many greens do I have? Oh, oh, I'm short on blues. Okay, I really need to focus on blues right now so I can bring that up. Um, and by the same token, you might find yourself looking at everybody else. All right, how many do you have? It really it seems like a shame that there isn't some kind of central line on the big player board where everybody can, where, you know, every time I take it, every time I shelve a card, it's a two step process. One, I shelve the card, and then two, whatever books are on that, I just go, oh, I got two reds and another green, so that everybody can at a glance see how they're doing relative to each other on the, right, how many yellows do you have? This is one where we're, whoever has the most yellows, that's a big deal. Okay, let me count all your yellows again. Yep, okay, I'm still in the lead. That becomes a bit cumbersome, and it's a big board. If they didn't need so much of that board to fill it with so many building spaces to build up over time, they could have devoted some of it to a track. To keep, so players would have, or heck, even the back side of the, of the clipboard, if that were a two-sided thing. So throughout the game, you don't only use it during scoring, but during play, you use that dry erase marker you have for everybody, and everybody can just keep checking off how many things they have. Something like that would have it really upped the playability quite a bit. But um, th th those quibbles aside, it's a really sharp game. If you like set collection, if you're at all attracted to the subject matter, if you like a lot of variety, there's a lot to recommend here in Ex Libris. And that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.